Okay, so up next, we have Community Talks, our afternoon plenary. Uh, we're going to hear from three organizations that are leveraging GEO's mapping, mapping tools, Google's mapping tools, um, for social and environmental impact. All right. Our first speaker, Rocio Palacios, is the external executive director at the Andean Cat Alliance, where they've been developing innovative conservation actions to empower local communities and providing customized solutions for global challenges. Rocio will tell us about how they're using uh, Earth, Google Earth, for Andean cat monitoring and conservation. Hand it over to Rocio. Great. Please join us in welcoming her. I have one. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you all for being here today. I'm here standing in front of you today to talk about a ghost a small wildcat that has been a mystery to science for more than, like, forever, until 20 years ago that we started working with this species. When we started working with the Andean cat, this blurry, pixelated, horrible picture was all that it was known about this species. And this is only 22 years ago. So at first, you know, it's, would you, you, you would think, how come nobody knew about a wildcat until not too long ago? Well, working with elusive species has its own challenges. Just picture this. When your own house cat decides to take a nap in a hiding spot, you're going to turn your house upside down and you're not going to be able to find him or her. Imagine trying to find a small wildcat that is just a little bit bigger than a house cat in a landscape like this. Where do you even start? So we started working with communities. And very early on, we found out that the Andean cat is sacred for native communities. This species is considered the communicator of the apus that are the spirits of the mountains. And it makes sense. Can we play a video, please? It makes sense because the Andean cat has special adaptations that allows it to thrive in this landscape. The big paws provides good grip in the rocks for chasing the prey. The long, bushy tail that you got to see, look, it's pouring right there. Get to, see, get to see it? So the long, bushy tail it uses for balancing on the rocks and also for covering when the frigid weather in the winter you know, hits them. They roll the tail over its head. And we learn. Other things, in the first years that we were working with the species, we learned what the main prey is. Who knows what species that is? Somebody here? Come on, it became viral a year ago. That's the mountain Vizcacha. They spend more of the day like that. Sun basking in the sun, doing nothing. And when they run, they are very fast. We also learn some special and very uh, new uh, information about what do they need to be in a, in a landscape. And putting together all this information, we were able to create the first distribution map and prob present uh, probability maps. These maps are very incomplete because it's a very, very hard species to study. We also were able to do the first population assessment map uh, uh, estimate. And this estimate kind of confirmed our worst fears. Less than 1,400 adult Andean cats roam these lands that go through four pretty big countries that are Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. So this is a very low density, very hard to study elusive species. So part of what we learned also were what the threats for the conservation of these species are. We have on one side here the damage to the landscape, habitat loss, habitat destruction, done by extractive industries, mainly mining and oil companies. Even when this particular damage seems very aggressive, we don't know if this damage is really affecting the cat. What will really affect the cat is the use of water. This is a very dry landscape. Also, hunting is an important threat in a lot of the big portions of the cat distribution. So we started working with communities. We changed our paradigm. We went from getting a lot of information about these species to working in conservation, active conservation with communities. 
We have different conservation programs. I'm not gonna get into it right now, but we can talk about that if you, if you want, just fetch me after. We have a, a conservation program that provides different economic alternatives for the communities. We have a different conservation program that reduces the conflict with mountain lions and culpeo foxes, facilitating coexistence. And we have a new program that is working to increase responsible ownership of domestic animals, reducing attacks on livestock and wildlife. And we finally have an educational strategy that transverses them all. But all of these programs work under the assumption that the Andean cats are gonna be present nearby. But how do we know if they are present or not? So this is the kind of landscape we work at. We work with two non-invasive tools. These are the most important ones. We do a genetic analysis of cats and other organic materials. Basically, we go to the field to collect cat poop because the cat poop in our houses is not enough, so we need to collect more. And we also use camera traps. Camera traps by far has been the most effective tool for finding information in the field in real time. And what is more important is that they don't only provide records of presence, but also of preferences, behaviors, and other important aspects. But how do we know where to put a camera in the field? Please let me uh, um, illustrate with an example here. Imagine we are invited to assess Andean cat presence in a site that it's been pushed to for creating a national park. The first thing we do is we pull our, our own data set to see if we have Andean cat records nearby. In this particular location, we have five records from a previous study. And then we start working with the community, that right here is a city right there, and doing different workshops for getting information to, to identify specific areas where the cat can be present. So we do several workshops and obtain different sources of information, and then we get into detail in each of one of these areas. And this is when Google Earth Pro, that part that, the desktop <laughs> option, becomes really, really powerful for us. Um, we, get, we, we are able to use other tools that are in, the, in Google Earth, like for instance, access to roads, to see how far away we have to walk and how long it's gonna take us to put the cameras. Then we get to use pictures uploaded by users. This may be random sometimes, but it gave, they gave us an idea of what kind of rocks do we have, what, uh, not only the kind of rocks, but the kind of formations, you know, if they have crevices um, that are lost to the, pres the presence of the species. Then we start checking very specific and in detail, accessibility. How long do we have to walk? Are they is accessible or not? And we finally put one camera. Once we have our first camera, we use the measuring tool of Google Earth to follow our, following our own protocol to install the other cameras. And we get our first set, an estimated set, where we wanna put the cameras. Of course, when we go to the field, the, the reality is always different, you know, but, but we get a first assessment of where to put the camera, so we know where to go. This was unthinkable, like 15 years ago. And when we go to the field, we put the cameras in the locations that they finally are gonna go, and using Google Maps, we put the point, like the marker in Google Maps, and then just export that point to Google Earth Pro. We're probably done with the video now. So there are a lot of positive things of using Google Earth. First, the first important advantage is that it does not really have a lot of requirements of internet speed. We work in four different countries. Sometimes we work in cities, but most times we work with communities that are highly isolated. Even when after the pandemic, we have more internet accessibility in most of our countries, the reality is that if they have internet, it's gonna be slow. So Google Earth Pro is the best option by far in regards of internet accessibility. It allows us to have a participatory and inclusive approach, getting involved people from different voices like power rages, military, groups of women, uh, teenagers, you know, tourist guys. Everybody can 
you know, speak and be part of the process. It does not require a lot of knowledge in technology, and this is very important. From all the groups that I just mentioned, some of them maybe have used Google Earth or even Google Maps, but some other people have never used anything, any of these spatial tools. So it's important that it's very, very accessible. And it, it allows us to do virtual meetings. Like in the middle of the pandemic, we got together with a park ranger and a group of people in Chile and Peru and Bolivia. We got together and trained a group of park rangers. Everybody, everything was locked. But these park rangers had to go do the season in the area that they were protecting. And we did the training and they put the camera traps by themselves and they got this fantastic picture. Compare this to the first picture that I saw you. And this was taken by a park ranger after implementing this process. So just wrapping up here a little bit, we, at first, as I told you, there was nothing known about this species. Now the Andean cat is in everybody's mouth. There are dozens of scientific papers. There are a lot of notes and, po um, and paper, you know, newspaper articles and things like that. Um, there are signs, road signs in places that the cats have been hit. Uh, there, it's in the currency, in the currency in Bolivia. Like in the highest currency bill in Bolivia is the Andean cat. And it's in videos, we are invited to fairs. And most importantly, if somebody sees an Andean cat somewhere, one of the Andean CAD members, because we have people in all four countries, one of the Andean CAD members is going to find out in less than 24 hours. And in some cases, like what you can see on top, central top of this picture, that cat that appeared in front of a bus, we can try to do something to help that individual. But um, uh, we have a last video here. So in the end, I think that what I'm trying to say is that as easy and as simple as Google Earth Pro may seem, may, may look, may appear, it provides us with like something that it was un unbelievable 10 years ago. It allows us to save resources and time that we can then use to implement our conservation actions and to make sure that this cat subsist in the landscape. Thank you, everybody. By the, by, the, by the way, if you want to talk about cats, I'm your person. <laughs> Thank you, Rocio. Amazing. Um, all right. OK, our next speaker is Ras Rasmus Ray. Rasmus is a senior developer at the Co Copenhagen Solutions Lab in the city of Copenhagen. He leads the city side of the Copenhagen Airview project with Google and the University of Utrecht. And he's going to tell us today how they are using hyperlocal air quality insights and other environmental insights for climate action in Copenhagen. Please join me in welcoming Rasmus. Hi guys, amazing to be here. So cities, cities, you already heard that half the globe is living in cities. That makes cities interesting in itself. But cities are also where reality and the real world hits the fan, so to speak. So all decisions made by the governing system ends up at city level. Think Katrina, think Sandy, think COVID. They're all city problems um, based on a lot of uh, other issues, of course. I'll not speak so much about cool tools. Um, I'll more speak about how we use data at the city level. Uh, I'll talk about three things. So um, one is a sort of political regulatory aspect. The second is a professional urban planning aspect. And the third one is really about the citizens. Um, so just Give, let me give you a bigger background. So Copenhagen is the capital of Denmark. In, the, in sort of the capital area, we have um, roughly a million people. We are probably known very much for uh, a climate plan for 2025 for to be neutral, but also a high living standard and quality of life. And that sort of uh, 
lies, what, what the ambition is, is actually try to make the best city for, for its citizens in, in those types of uh, strategies and plans. So in this sense, uh, air quality is actually coming up uh, quite a bit uh, as, a, as a topic that we need to investigate. So um, first of all, because there's a global awareness that it's actually much more harmful, WHO puts it up as number three uh, after violence and tobacco. Um, so let's take Copenhagen. It's a, cl a relatively clean city. We, have, uh, we are compliant with EU regulation but still roughly one out of 10 death is related to air quality in some, some sense. And then air pollution and air quality is also very important in, in sort of in relation to a lot of other issues. Climate is it's coming from the same sources as the climate, um, sort of climate change and and so solving one will lead to solving others. So, so there's a lot of co-benefits in it. And finally, um, people worry about air pollution. So uh, we, we have con conducted surveys that two thirds of, of our citizens is actually worried and, and contemplating to move out of the city to get out of the sort of air pollution in the city. So um, when, when Google approached us in 2017. Uh, we, we took the bet and, and to, to make a, a citywide project for Project Airview. Uh, so that is really to attach science grade uh, monitors for air pollution, put it in a Google car and drive the car for one and a half years to get a new type of data set that we didn't know. So we were very interested in learning the Pollution, learning about the pollution that was made in the city, not so much the one that blows over the, the city limits, but the ones that are uh, in, in the city. That is what we call NO2 or nitrogen dioxide. It is uh, the ultra-fine particles, so that's the sort of the smoke that comes out the tubes, and also the sort of the suit, which we call black carbon. Um, yes, so, so that is sort of those things made in, made in the city. <clears throat> yes, so my role, I was uh, leading the Copenhagen city part, um, and I'm situated in, in a sort of the innovation arm of Copenhagen that's called Copenhagen Solutions Lab, and it's a smart city coordinating office. But what we do is really we, we work with scientists, we work with companies, we work with partners, sort of to try to make new solutions and make new knowledge that can be applied to new city um, aspects. And yes, so that's, that's that. Um, so along the way, and this is the political aspect, we launched um, preliminary maps at the C40 summit that was held in Copenhagen in 2019. So this was a map. We had the mayor launch it, and the effect was actually quite amazing. So all of a sudden, everyone talked about air pollution. We had articles, news, people were talking very much about it. And God bless you. Um, and. Um, also, we had a lot of sort of political experimentation. Can we make safe zones? Can we do a lot of things? So, so the uptake to produce a release a map like this, even though it was preliminary, was enormous. So really high, high impact. Um, there was a lot of sort of city talks, uh, evening talks, local talks. What is, what is air pollution? How does it look in our community, in neighborhood? And our role in that was sort of to be in between the science and in the city. So, so uh, maintaining a good um, this debate level, but also very much on, on, uh, on, the, on the sort of maintaining the science, the scientific aspects of it as well. So the effects of the political impact was very much that we actually changed the national, the national regulation. So we can now do 
local emission zones, and that we could not before. So the emission zones were, were, were sort of defined by, um, by national level. So that's a major impact. So at the professional level, um, we're trying to say, if we do urban planning, can we actually move these data into urban planning, and what are the consequences? So for that, we started to work with Giel Architects, as a well-known Copenhagen firm, to see how that would look. And we very quickly came up with actually sort of two, two sets of tools. So one tool set would be, can we invite people? So invite them into the areas that are less polluted, so the exposure would be less and better off. And the other one was sort of, can we make protection? So we had the overall re regulation of making, making uh, how the pollution level would develop, but uh, in the meantime, we have to protect our people. We also look very much on safe routes and how do you actually design a city for safe routes and so on. So, so we try to do that. We also try to scale up a bit. So here we have neighborhoods in Copenhagen and it's very much centered around big inroads, but that will also give us a prioritization where to actually look to, to develop new solutions. And so this is a little bit more complicated because there's also differences in the different pollutants. So here we have the ultrafines. Before it was the inner two, and I guess you look at the purple area now. So the purple area is very much dominated by um, motorway and the in sort of the flight paths of the airport. And the irony is that people live in that area exactly for being in the fresh air and the nature side. So uh, that's a bit of a different, difficult situation. Um, so we started working with the citizens, and this is the, sort of the third aspect. So people really get um, that air pollution is bad for them. And so we work with them, we ask them, we got their daily routines where they hang out, where they travel, where they go, where they would like to be, and also very much about the pain points of the area. Can we actually work to improve the f sort of the wider setting of it, and not just, um, not just the air pollution bit? So the main problem is this area is that there's a lot of wind. So we, if, when we sort of started locally, and going out to, to measure inside where people would like to stay, we found out the air pollution is actually twice as high where there's not no wind. So people are very much caught between being in the wind and an unpleasant microclimate or being in a very polluted air. Yes. Okay, so that was, uh, we ended up doing a protective is sort of experimentation of doing domes. So also with the message that you have to be inside to go outside. Um, and these actually turned out to be very social meeting points. So not just being protective or get around air pollution, but also wind, but also very much created a space where people could meet. So there's a lot of uh, sort of social benefits from this. Uh, this is uh, one that turned out to be a yoga, um, hang out on Friday afternoons, and, and a lot of other stuff. Also, we did a bus stop, so right on, right on the station, there's a sort of a motorway on one hand and a lot of pollution. So people are actually sort of waiting in that area quite a bit. So this is um, another take on, on how a bus stop can look, where you can actually sit and talk to people. So we also monitored the other effects, and so, so the blue one up here is uh, the waiting uh, in, in the bus stop. So people wait, uh, of course, at a bus stop. But if you look, you see it's much more diversified what people are actually trying to do. The yellow are uh, electronics. So people uh, get out of their iPhones and so on and, and try to actually engage with people. The purple one is 
social talk or social engagement. So that was completely new. So we actually created a social meeting point on top of, of, uh, of this uh, in, in investigation. So that is sort of the, the people perspective, making cities better, not just for one aspect, but actually thinking holistically um, for this. Yes. Um, WHO came out with new guidelines, and, uh, and they are very much stricter than, than before. So that's very positive. They also set up interim targets, uh, so you should go from one to next. And I think this is where uh, cities really need help. Um, we have tried to sort of work on how to actually implement a new data set like, like the, the Google Airview but really the pace and the path of how we get from one level to the next is a really important one for, for the cities. It's not so much about tech, it's not so much about tools, but it's really what are the order we do, how do we engage people, uh, and so on. And one uh, aspect, so for the EIE team, is very much, it, it can list the benefits, the co-benefits of actually doing this. So improving air pollution and the air quality of cities, what does that mean in terms of reducing CO2? What does it mean in terms of improving health? What it means in, in terms of improving biodiversity? So we as cities can see the benefits and the sort of the business case of actually investing into this. Yeah, so that's my call to action. These are the partners. So for the main, main uh, investigation and the data collection, worked very hard with Utrecht uh, University and Google. And then also the rest of the partners are for the uh, implementation projects for urban planning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rasmus. Next up, we have our, our final speaker here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Nikki Tully, who is an assistant research scientist at Barry uh, NASA Ames Research. Nikki uses Earth observation satellite imagery to tell stories about the changes uh, that are being monitored from space and observing landscapes. Nikki's gonna tell us about the drought severity evaluation tool and the collaboration with the Navajo Nation. So, big hand for Nikki. Como reconozco mi identidad como indígena, reconozco a mis antepasados mexicanos latinos y quiero agradecerles a todos por estar aquí también. Hi, my name is Nikki Tuli and I'm from the Navajo Nation and I work with Barry NASA Ames Research Center. Today I'm here to share a story with you about the drought severity evaluation tool. However, um, and with the collaboration with the Navajo Nation. However, I'm gonna tell you a slightly different story from the perspective of the community itself. And it's through sharing this story that you'll hear about the, resili the resilience of the, the people and also the ways of knowing that existed prior to the tool coming to the community and ultimately leading to the story of the importance of collaboration and co-development in the work that we do and recognizing the importance that comes from the knowledge of the community held prior to being categorized as a tool end user. We've all seen this on the home webpage um, several of times, maybe you have read it, but I'd like to draw your attention to these words, positive impact in the world. This is where the foundation of all my work starts, and I'm pretty sure for a number of you, it's also the foundation of your work, but this is where I wanna start this story today. This photo that you see here is a road that is leading up to the home that I grew up in, and it leads to the home of my grandmother. In my introduction in Navajo, I recognize this place as my identity and where I come from. It tells a story of the connection I have as a Navajo woman to the landscape, but also to my identity that comes from water. 
through our, our one of our, uh, our founding creators, which is Changing Woman. We're a matrilineal society where I come from on the Navajo Nation. So everything is passed down through the woman. And in these stories that we carry with the landscapes and our connections aren't a myth, but our reality. And so this is important for the work to be included in the understanding for the work with the community. This here is a home that is a traditional home on the Navajo Nation. And there's some modern tweaks to it. Like you might notice the roof is a little bit different. However, this is not just a home, it's also a classroom. This is where the oral history is passed down. We don't write our history in books necessarily, but it's passed down from generation to generation through stories. And this is the first place that I learned about what resilience and adaptation means in a changing climate. I share these pictures here with you today to give you some examples of the community, the lifestyles and teachings that are conveyed in this area. You'll notice in these pictures that there's livestock, agriculture, there's a sense of the tradition and spirituality that is included in this community. There's also landscapes of the sacred sites of our sacred mountains that mark our territory. And also there is this mentality that is connected to this phrase, water is life, or as we say it in my culture, However, there are many other day-to-day -day impacts that we deal with in this community. And these are the anthropogenic impacts that are due to the natural resource extraction that have an impact on natural resources and an impact on the water resources itself. We have strip coal mining that has occurred. There's also a legacy of uranium mining and the continual impacts that occur. However, there's also a stark reminder of what you see here listed as a power, a power line running through the communities where often many of the homes will never receive electricity. And so that's a reminder of the progress that is needed to continuously be considered to be made. However, they're not our only just anthropogenic impacts. There are also climate change impacts. This here is that same road that is leading up to the home I grew up in. Now frequently there are dust storms and instances of sand dune migration in the area. Yet again, another reminder of the changing landscapes. However, this evidence of changing landscape has always occurred. This is an ever-changing world, and we're reminded of that. Yet again, here you see evidence of the fossil I'm holding in my hand that has the indentations of seashells. Along uh, millions of years ago, these were created in the, the Cretaceous Seas, that again, reminding where this dust storm is, it was one under um, complete underwater. So you can also tell that if you're a country fan, George Strait has some reasoning when he said there's oceanfront property in Arizona. Now, I want to bring you to this point here, the indigenous the net worldview. As developers, scientists, engineers, we often think everything starts at scientific methodology. However, I'd like to share this perspective. You all might be familiar with the word sustainability. If you come to my community and the culture and the part of the world that I work in, sustainability is defined as this, which essentially is meaning the harmony of the natural world and the universe and is essentially our way of knowing. The scientific methodology isn't looking at a hypothesis and moving forward to a solution, but we follow this cycle here of and you can see the English words identifying thereof. However, before anything came with the Western education, these teachings were shared to me through my grandparents and my parents, teaching me about the importance of what harmony is with landscape, sustainability, resiliency, adaptation, and what that would require in the 21st century. Moving forward and working in the theme of indigenous communities, there is one thing that should always be recognized, and that is the sovereignty of working with indigenous nations. And it's recognizing that there's a history that exists before we come there as outsiders, and acknowledging the beliefs, and this is done without of love and respect for the communities that I work with, that I continually remind myself of this. And now working with the Barry Nasa Ames group with the Indigenous Peoples Initiative, we follow this cycle here of the, the inclusion of the indigenous knowledge systems, being cognizant of the importance of community engagement, place-based approaches, and, and with our technical workshops of how to convey that knowledge. This is really done through what is called tribal consultation and engagement. And many of you can adapt this to the communities that you work with. 
However, this is, this is a lot of words on this slide, but knowing that this is a recorded presentation, you can refer back to this and pause it to really look into what this means of tribal consultation and engagement and what I focus on. Again, going back to the foundation of acknowledging the nation-to-nation -nation relationship and allowing the community to participate and how they wanna to choose to participate in the research or work that we're doing. This here is the Landsat image and it was really the first connection to my understanding of what earth observation and remote sensing is. As you can tell, it was a complete, or you might not be able to tell, but I can tell you it was a complete culture shock leaving my family and my home and my community where we talked our language and everybody looked similar. However, it's through an image like this and through earth observation and remote sensing that I found home yet again. And this was through the work that now I have begun to weave together of Western science, indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, and bringing that experience of a lived experience in this landscape I come from. Bringing them all together now with my research, but also with the work that I am currently doing. And this leads me to this, of where all of what I've just shared with you comes together. And this is the drought severity evaluation tool. As you can tell by the project team here that there are a number of people and communities and organizations that are involved in this project of what has led to what has been referred to as sovereignty and science and working with one indigenous nation of several in the United States. Again, I wanted to remind you that we don't follow necessarily looking at the administrative boundaries, but remember the landscape uh, boundaries that are set for us as this Navajo nation. So here you see the Navajo seal and the Navajo flag that we have with that rainbow of sovereignty. And again, sharing that four sacred mountains of where we dwell. But however, for more of a relatable stance, you'll see here on a global scale that the Navajo Nation is located in the southwest of the United States and the, the states of Utah, New Mexico, and, and Arizona. This tool, DSET, the Drought Severity Evaluation Tool, is a spin-off of, of Climate Engine. And what this has done is that, again, focusing on knowing that there are ways of knowing and ways of thinking and ways of interacting with the landscapes of Navajo that has come together for this project. This project DSET was funded by the NASA Western Water Applications Office and it's unique in this manner that it was co-developed with the Navajo Nation itself with the Department of the Division of Water Resources and the Desert Research Institute. And through this collaboration and the discussion of understanding what it means to work with the landscape in a unique people that has a different way of knowing and language, it has with that code development and collaboration has identified these four main points. So thinking about what we do with the work of analyzing different things through coding and scripting, but taking a step back and thinking how a community might interact with this tool, the coding and scripting went to the side a bit, and these were the main things that took focus, that this tool would be a free web application, that it would be user-friendly, that it would be a time and storage saver, and also make easier to the analyzing and visualizing that would be made to understand and connect with the data. And so this all came together with the Navajo Nation providing ground data, working with the satellite data and the da modeled uh, data and drought indices. And this is what you get at the bottom. And this is the drought severity evaluation tool webpage where now people on the Navajo Nation and primarily those interested in water resource management can go in and put the variables that they're interested to create their analysis, primarily looking at drought being one of the major interests and the impacts on water resources on Navajo. And what this, the outcomes and the deliverables from this tool is it's easy to, um, to use interface, but also it creates these on the fly maps and time series, all based on, on the web that this analysis can be done without having to download it, but being cognizant that the, da the data could be downloaded. And taking it a step further and understanding the communication between the community to science, the technical and, and the social science part was, this is a micro example of what we did. And this is the Nav Navajo Nation Drought Severity Evaluation Tool in which the introductory video of this, which you can find on the website, was created in the Navajo language to describe what climate change meant and how the tool connects to it so that other future water users on Navajo could, could understand and connect to the data being created in this tool. I want to invite you to uh, one of the unconference of events here on Thursday of where you could also participate in a, an event coming up on the Navajo Nation where we're looking at creating some images uh, for the Navajo Nation for this community gallery event. And this is the Nehemana Hassan event that is in the plans. Again, to remind us that uh, for this work, the community is always central. 
Lastly, I'd like to thank you all for being here today for your interest to make a positive impact on the world. I have that mentality, mentality from my culture of working in seven generations. What this means is that we're thinking to those who are ahead of us, those future generations coming. And this is quite befitting of this picture of my niece who is one of those future generations. And she gives me hope. Why she gives me hopes is for this picture here. If you might not be able to see it quite clearly, you can go back and look at the computer screen. But what this says on here, it says, I would build a house of. And her response was, I would build a house of mud because I am Navajo and I like being Navajo. And if you remember from that first picture of the Hogan, that's how our traditional homes, homesteads are. It doesn't have the, the wooden or metal roof, it's made out of mud. And so her reminding me of that, of being connected not only to the culture, but being connected to the landscapes and the technical influences we can have on this type of development to help in that world of sustainability, helps me to keep going and reminds me that with our work, let's keep reminding ourselves of the community and the people that we are working with and the opportunities that we have to empower others to where they are encouraged but also uplifted that we can work together and through the many multiple possibilities of collaboration and co-development to build upon that resilient history that is already in existence into the communities that we are working with in this ever-changing world. So I can't speak for the Navajo Nation as a whole, nor can I speak for all indigenous people. I just speak from this one singular lived experience of that I have had. Thank you.